plenty of seats here. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks to all who came out tonight. We're very, very happy to see you in the hallways. Uh, this is always a very, very happy uh, and joyous occasion for both the campus and community. And we're very pleased that you chose to spend the evening with us. This is the 14th Annual African American History Month Lecture. Uh, it's a program that has been spearheaded by the Department of History for most of these years. And fortunately, this year, we have a huge outpouring of support for what we're trying to accomplish and for bringing this wonderful speaker to you tonight. Before we begin, um, as many of you know, we lost two giants within the space of one month, uh, just these past uh, couple of months. Leroy Benjamin Frazier and John Lewis Brandon were both what has been called bridge builders here. For many of us, they were also architects. They were also the progenitors of what all of us have been trying to do for many, many years and that is to pave the way for those that come behind. So in whatever way is uh, in your tradition, we ask you to observe a moment of silence. <coughs> Yeah. 
has assembled the most diverse senior leadership team in the history of the university. Please join me in bringing up Chancellor Carroll Fulton. He is 
a leading scholar of Caribbean and African diaspora. He was a member of the UNC faculty from 1980 to 1994. He was the first black African American chair in the college, and he served as the chair of the UNC history department from 1986 to 1991. And I've had amazing testimonies of him from Jen Ray McNeil. And just as I was sitting down, Lloyd Kramer was telling me how important you were to his uh, life here and his career. And I think there could be many people who would be standing up here to say thank you and celebrate you tonight. So we are going to, uh, he is going to be one of our bridge builders. You heard a little bit about that program, but it's a new program that we put in place where we're naming scholarships for students after people who really were the ones that helped make this university the place that it is. It is our hope that we'll, we will eventually have a hall with their stories and their portraits for everyone to see. But tonight, we're really having a chance to thank and to honor Dr. Palmer for paving the way for others to follow. Your example has been important to so many. Thank you. Palmer Lecture in African American History, 
University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, 21st of February, 2018, and that he is the scholar and academician and our leader, uh, as you know, having been the first African American to chair the department in the College of Arts and Sciences, and we honor and we revere our first. Work. 
at UNC, the nation's first and the most public university of the people in our nation. We have 22 sponsors, and I'll follow Joseph Jordan's wise counsel in acknowledging that they are all in the program. <laughs> Beginning with the office of Chancellor Carol Folt and ending with the Women's Center. And I've been asked to acknowledge some special friends, and we cannot begin to even think about this evening without acknowledging Jenna Ray McNeil.
2010, when he was asked, he could still recall his St. Louis library card number. <laughs> 5715980 indicates <laughs> the year that he received it. He was eight years old. When reflecting upon his youth, Gerald Horn recalls the, that he had many public adventures and that he read and learned much from his sisters. And I quote, I read what they read, I learned the songs they did, I still know a lot of Johnny Matthews' songs and lyrics. In the end, his sister's academic focus, however, was the greatest influence on Gerald Torn. He read biographies about famous figures in United States history and went on to mature in many ways in his, uh, in his preference for scholarly works and for novels. It is no surprise that he then went on to, with an excellent record, to attend Princeton University. But even at Princeton, we want to note that he was the founding member of Princeton's Association of Black Regents. <coughs> he participated in the anti-apartheid protests, including taking over the financial complex building, which resulted in um, verbal attacks by some of his classmates. But nonetheless, uh, this was something that was taking place at the time when we had very bad policies on South Africa in the United States. And he was one who was not willing as a college student to be without a voice in that struggle. Professor Moore's <coughs> activism has been really inexhaustible. And I want to add that uh, you may um, know that he at one point ran for political office and that he had a career as an attorney, an activist attorney, before he um, turned his attention entirely to scholarship. Uh, he then went on to serve in a variety of departments and they find that information listed in your program. But I do want to mention that when he was working as an attorney, uh, he was indeed one who was an attorney for the workers and has continued to support workers in such ways that they continue to award him prizes and look to him uh, for his counsel. He was uh, at one time the special counsel to the Service Employees International Union for Health and Hospital Workers. And then finally, let me say that Gerald Horn was an influential and very important figure here at the University of North Carolina, having served as the director of the Stone Center before Joseph Jordan, having served as the director of the Institute of African American Research before uh, our present director, and at that time, he brought to the campus scholars from throughout the diaspora who were working on such things as the African American history and African American studies in Japan, in Canada, and scholars from those areas would come as well as those in the United States. We benefited so greatly from his presence. Uh, we are grateful that he has been willing to return to us and to share from his great wealth of knowledge, I introduce to some and present to others, Gerald Horn. Creation of 
this center. And this building would not have been built but for the activism and energy of students. And so they <laughs> U.S. 
and African American history that posits steady progress within a system designed to accommodate our demands is woefully inadequate. We desperately need a new narrative of US history and African American history. Part of the problem has been, as I have suggested, an overestimation of the transcendent progressivism of 1776, which has hampered the ability to engage in a critique that could save black lives. Thus, this idea that an 18th century constitution birthed with the dripping blood of enslaved Africans from the notorious three fifths clause forward is somehow sufficiently elastic to encompass those originally excluded from its boundaries.